Guys, um, you may remember a long time ago, there was uh, the Extinction Rebellion movement. A bunch of left-wing hippies came and made everybody's lives a bit more difficult. Now, and, and I'm aware that there are many Christians that struggle to see uh, how science and the Christian faith connect to one another. And often uh, posit that the two are in conflict with one another. Now, as someone who studied physics and studied science, I'm utterly against the idea that science and religion are against one another. Bring, bring that atheist over, let him hear this, right? And so, to try and demonstrate this point, what I would like to have is a conversation with someone who's very shortly going to be a doctor. A doctor in physics, and we're going to talk about the environment. Because lots of Christians, and I understand why, reject the whole issues around uh, what's happening to the environment because it is being championed by people that beyond that stand for a lot of very bad things like abortion and euthanasia and divorce and liberal attitudes towards you know a whole range of identity issues okay but what I want to show to you is that these things should not we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater um, and so, I, I want to talk about, for instance, the Patriarch of Constantinople, who at this moment is a prisoner of the Turkish state. Um, and because he can't speak freely, he's had to champion theologies that the Turkish state will let him get away with. And so he has written huge amounts on what we would call green theology. And this doctor-to-be, um, um, we're, we're going to just talk about science, uh, faith, um, Genesis and the the environment and, and so on and so forth. So yeah. just give an introduction about what your specialism is. You don't need to give too many personal details away, but what you're studying and why you're studying. Okay, um, so I did a degree in physics and now I'm doing uh, postgraduate studies in the physics of climate change. So I'm looking at how global warming and how the effects of that are affecting atmospheric circulation and particularly extreme events and heat waves. So, so give us some examples of, of the kind of things that you're talking about. So, I mean, so, so global warming is, um, is a very well established fact scientifically. Why? Because there's lots of people that would immediately deny it. Okay, um, you can do experiments, you can look at history, and it's very clear that carbon dioxide heats the atmosphere. Yeah. Why that does that is because it absorbs long wave radiation. So the sun shines heat on the earth, radiation on the earth. Um, that is shorter wave than the radiation that comes back from the earth. And this is because of, as you might know from physics, black bodies. Yeah. So short, short wave, higher energy. Sun, high temperature, high energy, goes to Earth, heats up the Earth. The Earth reflects some of that, and then... Back the, out into space. Back out into space, but carbon dioxide in the atmosphere absorbs that, and so re-radiates it back to Earth. So it's acting like a, a shield, like a greenhouse. Yes, essentially, yeah, like a blanket, so yeah, yeah, like a greenhouse, yeah. yeah. Um, so the more carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere, uh, the greater warming there'll be at the surface. Yeah. So, um, and by atmosphere, I'm, I'm referring to the first 10 kilometers, essentially. Yeah. So the troposphere. And, and, and am I right in understanding that one of the ways that you, you could re reproduce that in a lab is you get like a, a, a sealed sphere, you feel you, you, you fill it with carbon dioxide and other gases, give it a temperature, and then you can radiate it and watch its temperature grow, and then do the same experiment without an increase in carbon dioxide with the same amount of light source but the temperature doesn't increase as much yes that's yeah, one of you the, could see that the yeah. basic experiment because it's absorbing because it's absorbing the radiation okay yeah and and the scientific principle as i'm sure you know it actually originates from christian thought a christian worldview absolutely do, are you able to talk about that in any way or do you want me yes. to talk about that yeah i mean I mean, chip and wherever. Yeah. I but the basis of science is that the world is intelligible, um, that there are rational 
laws and processes that govern the universe and that we are able to discover those things all of which make sense in a biblical worldview um, where human beings are made in the image of God where there is one God who created all things and us being in his image mean we can understand his ways to some degree and his universe. And so the first natural philosophers were Christians seeking to discover the mind of God yes. by exploring the natural world and they actually saw it as a spiritual exercise mm. to draw into the, 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 the mind of God. So you've got people like Francis Bacon, yes, for the, instance. Yeah, he, yeah, he's a very good example because you could, you could almost trace the origin of science to him depending on exactly how yeah. you define things. Yeah. But he was the first to formulate the scientific method and he did it in explicitly Christian terms. Yeah. And Occam, you know, Occam's razor, yep. he would be another example uh, of Christians who have contributed to the development of science. Mm. And historically what happened was that in the 1900s, a movement emerged called Biblical Fundamentalism, which emerged within certain sections of the Protestant community that was reactionary to the development of science and, and sought to juxtapose in opposition scientific discovery with um, the, um, the, the Christian faith and, and, and took a literal reading of things like Genesis, didn't they? Yes. Yeah. And there's, there's an important point there because in some sense that fundamentalism was a reaction to what had already been happening, which yeah. is the Enlightenment and this idea that God is somehow out, and you can trace it back to kind of Descartes, the idea yeah. that, that God is sort of out there somewhere, and actually it's the natural laws that govern the world, and then God somehow intervenes. But that's not the biblical worldview. The biblical yeah. worldview is that the whole of everything that's happening is because God is involved in every level of creation. Yeah. And, and if, you so, look at, if you look at the Church Fathers, I don't know if you know this, but the Church Fathers, they, particularly, for example, Oregon, categorized ways of interpreting the scripture and, and they emphasized the allegorical above the literal. Mm, yes. And so when they came to things like Genesis, St. Augustine was pointing out the obvious problems if you took a literal reading of Genesis. Yeah. And he was arguing that actually it was more metaphorical yeah. than literal. Yes. I mean, yeah, yeah. As a Christian and as a scientist, how do you read Genesis? Um, so I read Genesis. I love Genesis, actually. It's a really great book, and it tells us really profound, deep truths about God and humanity. And it's important to remember that um, one simple way of putting it is the Bible was written for us yep. as Christians, but it was not written to us. Yes. Um, so, and, and, the, and the other more obvious point is that Genesis is not a science textbook. You yeah. know, chapter one is obviously an incredible poem and it tells us lots of deep truths about God and how he orders all things and brings order out of chaos. And then, um, you know, the structure of it, the structure of the week, how he's brought, you know, timings and things have there. Everything has its own place. Yeah. And Genesis, so, I mean, I, I, I don't read Genesis literally. I don't think it is a literal mm. uh, book. No. Um, and, but, and there are clues all over Genesis yes, that yeah. it's not literal. Yeah, it's, it's clearly not trying to tell a, a complete... Exactly. Even, like, so, like, mankind uh, appears twice in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. You know. and, and you've got things like, well, where does Cain's wife come from? Or, yeah. It's, it's clearly, it's not interested in telling you all of the details or in presenting a scientific account of origin. No. But it's a... And, but there's clear yeah. metaphorical imagery, like uh, the word that's translated as Adam. Mm. is Adwama, which can be both translated as dust and mankind. Yeah. You know, um, the day that is translated as age could mm. also be, sorry, the day that's translated as day could also be translated as age. Yeah. The, the literary form of Genesis 1 is poetic, mm. you know. Um, the, and, and, and really what Genesis is doing is it, it is speaking to a polytheistic world and it is saying to the people of Israel, that all these other nations may believe that there's a god of the water and a god of the heavens and a god of the land and a god of the animals and the god of the beasts and a god of mankind but but actually there's only one god 
Mm. It's a declaration of monotheism in the face of polytheism. Yes, absolutely. You know. Yeah. Um, and, and that's its real purpose. Its real purpose is theological, not scientific. Mm. So when we try to read Genesis like a scientific textbook, mm. we're actually abusing Genesis yeah. as a piece of literature. Yeah, you're not, in that sense, it's almost, you're not, you're not reading Genesis and it's, it's almost like you're not taking Genesis what it's literally meaning because yeah. you're not because because you're you're taking it out of its context yes. and you're saying that oh I, I'm reading this with you know as as a modernist and as a science textbook rather than thinking well what actually does this mean in the original context of it yeah so it's a way of being faithful to Genesis that we read it absolutely and 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 you don't find as a Christian that your study of the natural world conflicts with a theological reading of Genesis no, no, not no. at all. In fact, confirms it actually. So go like on, the, ex explain. So, um, well, as we mentioned earlier, the the basis for science itself, the reason why science works, it makes a lot of sense in a biblical worldview, where there is one God who has created all things. Um, you know, over and against the polytheistic worldview. Now we can see that you know, the history of science is a discovery of various disparate phenomena that we know are linked, electricity and magnetism, now uh, electromagnetism, and then that was further unified with um, the weak nuclear force and so forth. So there's a, you know, that Newton's discovery of the, what keeps us on the earth is the same as what keeps the planets moving around. Yeah. So it all points to, it all points to order, it all points to essentially a creator, a law, and, yeah. and a lawgiver. In terms of this idea of pointing towards a rational world, mm. which is what it points to, and is one of the very bases upon which Christians began to explore the natural world, it also, I, I find it peculiar that, it, that the Bible gets so many things almost coincidentally right. Mm. Not little things either. Yeah. So one of the things that Genesis is always attacked for is the idea that light existed before the sun. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, the gas ball that collapsed into the sun, as it was re reaching the kind of necessary temperatures for nuclear yeah. um, fusion, mm -hmm. would have radiated light in, at the infrared level and maybe even above that, yeah. before it had become a sun. Yes, absolutely. And so Genesis is correct in that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because that's exactly what Genesis 1 says, it says there was light before there was a sun. Yeah. I, I mean, we know, from, we know from science that the whole universe is glowing the cosmic microwave background. Yeah, yeah cosmic yeah. microwave background. And then you've also got the fact that in Genesis it talks about um, you know the 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 waters being gathered into un, unto one place so that the dry land might appear. Mm. And we know that all the continents were drawn together, that, that they emerged as a single supercontinent. Yes, yeah. You know Pangea. Like, what was Pangaea? Yeah. yeah. Pangaea. And then split apart later. Mm. Um so I I I, I, I I'm remonstrating this point because I want Christians to stop seeing science as a threat to the Christian faith. Mm. You've got to recognize, brothers and sisters, that there's an enlightenment narrative that points to Darwin and points to Galileo and, and seems to categorize the whole relationship between the church and science as being one of uh, conflict. But it forgets the fact that the Vatican established one of the very first um, what they call now? The, the Observatory. Observatories. Yeah. Copernicus was supported by Christians in, in his work. Absolutely. I know he came into to conflict, but 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 many scientists have, mm. have been supported by it. So well, I mean, Copernicus is an interesting example because actually, he, yeah, he, he he had correspondence with the Pope, and he actually presented his findings to the Pope. At, yeah. Um, Pope yeah, Pope Clement. So the Pope was so, interested in what Copernicus was doing. Yeah, yeah. You know. Why, why would that happen if Christians had this attitude that science and religion were against one another? Mm. It didn't. Yeah. This is a modern thing that came from the 1900s. Mm. Now, coming back to the environment. Yes. There are people that get in and argue that the earth has been hotter in the past mm. and it is just warming back up. Okay. What would you say to them? So, it's true that the earth's been hotter in the past. Um, and the reason for that, the reason, and we, and we know it well, we know it from at ice cores and we can look at um, you can do various methods of, of dating and, and look at the constituents of the atmosphere and and we know we know why 
Uh, it's because the there are slight changes in the Earth's orbit around the Sun. Yeah. Um, they're called Milankovic cycles. Yeah. It's, it's not always an exact straight line, uh, so, a, exact circle. In a kind of ice age at the moment, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. Right, because there's ice in the Earth. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Very nice. So, so there have been there have been there have been points in Earth's history where previously there's been it's been hotter. But the difference that's happening now is that because of our extra us putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, we are heating the Earth up at a rate that is much, much faster than has been ever seen in the history. And, and is that evidenced by looking at the ice cores and measuring the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere in the past vis-a-vis -vis today? Yes, yeah, and, and uh, other measures as well. Give me, give me some examples so, of other measures. So, I mean, d depending on how far, we, how far we go back, you can, you can look at um, dendrochronology, so tree rings. Yeah. Um, you can measure the amount of the, the, yeah, the rate of growth of different trees. You can measure the. Um, I mean, we've got very good measurements to within a, you know within a degree since when we've had temp since when we've had thermometers and yeah. global warming has just shot right up in terms of all of that. So yeah. um, and also, I mean another another point to mention actually is that the temperature of the Earth was was heating up and that would in some sense sometimes you had carbon dioxide increasing as a result of that so we had the you know the change in the cycle of the earth means that we get more sun and then that leads to co2 but what's happening now is human beings are putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere yeah so and methane other gases and how are we doing that give give us some examples the obvious the obvious cars um Planes, planes are, are surprisingly bad actually because it goes yeah. right up into the stratosphere. Yeah. Um, so it's already right up at the higher level where um, where there's a greater warming effect. Yeah. And um, yeah, so all fossil fuels, coal, um, gas not so much, but gas as well. But yeah, yeah. Um, I think and 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 and. And you deforestation see, as well. I, there's, it could, yes, go and, and you've got yeah. the, 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 the one of the, the alarming things mm. that is connected to human behaviour, but and, and partially overlaps with the idea of global warming, mm. is the collapse of biodiversity. Absolutely. We yeah. have. Uh, we're, we're actually, l ladies and gentlemen, living through an, an extinction level event. Yes. But it is such a slow car crash. We keep adapting our perspective to it so it never alarms us. Hmm. Now, you, you got involved as a Christian with the Extinction Rebellion, did you not? Yes, yes. Tell me and why, considering that these are people that push abortion, they push euthanasia, they push liberal attitudes towards divorce, the redefinition of marriage. Why, as a Christian, did you get involved with a movement that, that packages along all those other things? Mm -hmm. Well, so, so firstly, I'm, there, there's actually lots of Christians involved in Extinction Rebellion. It's yeah. really interesting that um, even a lot of the people who've been arrested were part of Christians for Climate Action. Yeah. Um, ultimately, my concern for, and obviously not, not all of them go along with the whole package and the whole narrative, but, um, and I certainly wouldn't agree with... So you, di you disagree with liberalising divorce laws? Yes. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and you're not a supporter of abortion? I am not a supporter of abortion. Uh, no. I, all right, you're against the euthanasia, the redefinition of marriage. Yeah. yeah. So, it, so it's possible to be a Christian mm. and to own this issue. Yes. And the the way that we that we tend to frame it as as Christians, the way I look at it, is by seeing climate change not as an issue primarily that affects animals or plants but something that affects human beings and particularly those lowest in society the poor the poor exactly so um, you can you know the, who are the people who suffer the most from droughts it's the poor the poor yeah it's the it's the vulnerable it's the people who can't afford to shield themselves shield themselves them. yeah, and, yeah and as Christians it is fundamental to a Christian ethic and worldview to stand in solidarity with the poorest. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, I, I, I am someone who has a concern about the environment and about what is happening. 
Mm. Um, what do you think the prospects are from where we are going into the future? Um, good question. So, um, not great on every indication. Um, things are getting a lot worse. Um, the emissions in the atmosphere that we are doing are constantly increasing. Uh, we are seeing the effects of that more and more. More people are suffering. Um, there's increased levels of, in, I mean, in this country, flooding is the main thing. Yeah. Um, the collapse of biodiversity in, in British wildlife. Yes. Yeah. And um, and these are all these are all real concerns and 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 very uh, very worrying. How, which is why, to address the concern, you need something quite fundamentally you need some quite big change ultimately though the Christian perspective is to see it all not as a change of the system but as a change of the heart yeah because as our Lord said all the, all the evils in the world all the injustices in the world aren't don't come from the system as the kind of the liberal yeah. media would put it but yeah. but it but it comes from the heart yeah. comes Christ from, was not a Marxist Christ was not a Marxist yeah, there was not. Christ was not a Marxist <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I put it to you, hmm. as much as I agree with the agenda, yeah. I put it to you that it's already too late. Okay. That actually, what we, the, uh, the awareness and what we're trying to do now should have happened 60, 70 years ago, hmm. uh, and maybe we might have been able to stop it. Yeah. But at this exact moment in time, given the sin human heart, that we are, it, it is not a question of whether we're going to escape a disaster. Mm. It is simply a question of how big that disaster is going to be. Yes. Thoughts? Um, yes, I broadly agree with you. Yeah. How, so, how bad, like, and I'm sorry to be pessimistic, but I think we also have to be realistic. Yes. How bad do you think things will get? Um, that's a good question. Um, Things are going to get a lot worse. Give me examples of the kind of things that we can expect to happen going forward. Um, countries will disappear. It's almost, it's almost entirely, and yeah, again, we just have to face the facts here. Yeah. Um, the Maldives are probably going to just vanish. Um, yeah. The, so that, you know, entire countries, and a country, you know, is a culture, a community, yeah. language, everything. Um, it's... Um, there's going to be increased inequality in the world. Yeah. Um, there are going to be, in the UK, probably the main effects will be flooding. Yeah. I think, um, and the, um, I suspect, food prices will go up as well. Yeah. Um, I think. I think what we what we will look at. But but it will. Yeah. It it's sort of, it's an increasing and again like broader worldwide. We might not suffer as much as, as other countries. But things like the Great Barrier Reef is, is, is gone. Is but I mean, gone. that's going to have a knock-on effect to the ecosystem. Absolutely. What, what yeah. we're going to see actually is a massive, huge collapse of biodiversity. That's what we are seeing, yeah. yeah. But that's going to accelerate. Mm. Like, there, there will be species of animals that we, alive today, will remember that future generations will only know in photographs. What I find I, uh, strange is that actually the the scriptures give us a message about how to survive an extinction level event. Hmm. What story am I alluding to? Um, Revelation? No, come on. <laughs> no, I'm talking about Noah and the oh, ark. Oh, of course. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like there's an extinction level event and the narrative of the story of Noah tells us how to preserve mm -hmm. by creating arcs. Yeah. Like, things are going to go tits up in the world, to put it bluntly, mm. and to put it gently, but the, the reality demands much stronger language. Mm. But one of the ways that we can try to survive ourselves and try to preserve as much as we possibly can of the ecology mm. is to try to create arcs, to mm. store and nurture and to preserve as much as we possibly can to survive the flood yeah. that's coming. Mm. And it is going to be a flood. Because you, 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 you know about, like there's gonna be some, there's the danger of what we call um, 
what's it called, where it begins to run away with itself and become self-perpetuating. What's that called? Um, so you have positive tipping points. Tipping points, yes. yes. So give us some examples of possible tipping points that we, we might have. So, um, yeah, this is the real fear with, with um, this is what people mean when they talk about climate change as a global catastrophe. Yeah. Um, when, for example, the North Pole melts sea ice, as we've, as we've seen it's been doing over the last three decades, it's been yeah. dramatically decreasing, that makes, um, that replaces snow and ice with oceans. Yes. And oceans are much better at absorbing heat. So the Earth absorbs more as we lose more ice, which means that the Earth absorbs more and so there is a positive heat, and there's many, there's many other examples. And right now, we're measuring an increase in, in heat temperature in the oceans, aren't we? Yes. It's locking away heat even now, recordably. Yes, yeah, yeah. And carbon dioxide as well, which has a secondary effect of making the oceans more acidic. And the consequence for that is? Uh, the potential collapse of life in the oceans. And the result of that will be horrendous. Yes, yeah, yeah. Absolutely horrendous. Yeah. And I think, I, I, and, and, and increased desertification, mm. as we're seeing, the desert is literally leaping across the Mediterranean. We're seeing desertification in Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece. We're seeing desertification in California. We're, we're, we're seeing desertification in Texas. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the expanse of the desert is increasing, isn't it? Yeah. You know, yeah. And it, it seems to me that, that I, and I'm not someone who desperately looks around for the end of the world. I'm not one of these Christians who's looking for the apocalypse. Mm. But in scripture, it talks about the four riders. Yes. Death, famine, disease, and war. Yeah. And if the ecosystem collapses, human population continues to explode, the amount of land and resources decrease. It seems obvious to me that what we will have is famine, wars over resources, death, and an increase in disease. Yeah. Those, I mean, those are all already happening. It's, it's already happen. started. Yes. You know, yeah. and I'm not someone who's desperately looking to, to find the hints of the end of the world. Mm. And in, in Revelations, it talks about a disaster coming that would drive humanity under the mountains. Where, where men would climb under the mountains and then cry out to the heavens, cry out to God, oh, oh mountains cover us, oh, mountains protect us. Mm. Yeah. Now, if we start to get global runaway, uh, global warming, like if the permafrost over Siberia defrosts yes. and you have all those swamps with methane mm. melt and then go, release all their methane at the same time. Yeah. Now, what, what's the problem with huge amounts of methane suddenly being released together at, at the same time into the atmosphere? So, um, like, me, like carbon dioxide, methane is a greenhouse gas as well. Yeah. So, it has that same effect of when you put it into the atmosphere, um, radiation that's reflected back from the Earth is reabsorbed. Um, but it's much more dramatic. Um, it's three it's, times more dramatic. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't stay in the atmosphere as long. Um, but it would, if you put lots of methane into the atmosphere, that would have a huge, um, quite immediate effect. It would have, a, it's like a bomb effect, isn't it? Yes, yeah. So you've got this huge, you've got all these lakes and swamps that have fermented for centuries. Mm. There's, there's carbon dioxide in those swamps as well. Actually, yeah, yeah. So, and, yeah, and they will all, it would, if the permafrost melted and they all became liquefied, all that gas would suddenly get released all at once. Yes. And have a massive impact. Mm. Now, if we end up with runaway, if we end up with runaway greenhouse gases and yes. a greenhouse global warming and, and biodiversity collapses and the ecosystem collapses, what's the most logical thing that man will do, being the intelligent ape that he is? Um, bury himself? He'll, he'll run into the mountains, will he not? Yeah. He'll hide himself from the radiation mm. and he will dig caves out and then he will try to survive Mm. On plant, on plantain and growth through uh, UV lights and what they can grow in a lab. Yeah. So it's quite. It, it is a, a, a. It is not. It is a distant prospect. Mm. But it's actually now visible on uh, as one possible future for mankind. Yes. That we will be reduced to 
surviving by our fingertips, hidden under the mountains, whilst the world burns. Yeah. And, yeah. and I fear, I genuinely fear that that is a, a possibility that m because man, because this, this catastrophe is happening so slowly and we keep accommodating ourselves to the catastrophe, mm. that, that, that it just unfolds in front of us and we keep just adapting and adapting and adapting and adapting and then three, four hundred years into the future, yeah. maybe, maybe a thousand, we're in mountains eking out a living yeah, it's it's not a good prospect, and of course, we may keep adapting, but then we'll leave you know, billions of people behind. They who won't. Who, be, who, they, who they, won't they, be able yeah. to adapt? And, no, and they won't. So, so, yeah. What what is a what what can we do? What kind of things can we do? What kind of things can we do? So I think. So one of the first, as a foundation, I think. As a Christian, I want to say that we have hope in a better world. Um, that we don't belong to this world, we belong to our life is hidden in Christ and God, right? Uh, we, we have a, we, we look for a better place, but that is a renewed world, a renewed and a new creation where, there, new is, creation, where yes. there is justice yep. and there is, yeah, the justice flows down the rivers and righteousness like an ever flowing stream and, and that that is, so we can have hope in the future. So yes, you know, we need to be real about the facts and what is possible. But, but we have, in the conversations that you have with people, um, when this comes up, and it will increasingly come up, share that, share that vision for hope. And, you know, that stops us from all being, that counters the fatalistic narrative of saying, the one oh, that I've just panned out for everybody. Yes, yeah, yeah yes, but w along with that of, oh, it's we're all doomed, therefore let's... Just do what we want. Let's just do what we want. Christians have a responsibility to the environment. Absolutely. And that's there in Genesis. And, uh, yes, and, and to our neighbour. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and in, in Genesis it says that, that man should dominate the earth, mm. but it also says he should cultivate it. Yes. Yeah? yeah. He has a responsibility as a steward to the possession of God that God has given him lordship over. Yes. To return that possession to his maker in good faith, in good condition. Mm. And that's the kind of theology that the patriarch of Constantinople is, is talking about. Yeah. Which, by the way, we have to pray for the freedom of the patriarch of Constantinople mm. and the liberation of the, the Christians of Turkey because the, they, they can't even have their freedom to choose their own patriarch or have a patriarch come outside of Turkey which is totally an anathema to how the Christian church works. Um, yeah. But what I, 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 I would leave um, you with, and please do comment on this, mm -hmm. is that we as Christians have to own this issue and not allow liberal progressives to own it. Because mm -hmm. if we don't own this issue, the liberal progressives will attach this issue to all their other agendas. Mm -hmm. And this issue can't be ignored eventually the environment will force us to deal with it but if we allow the liberal progressives to own it with their agenda that means when governments have to deal with this issue they will tag it to all the other agendas as well mm. but if christians can own this issue for themselves when increasingly governments have to deal with this issue it means that there can be a way to deal with this issue that doesn't then adopt everything that the liberal progressives stand for mm. what are your thoughts on it yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we need to. Um, yeah, we need to own it. We need to. And for me, it you know, it comes back to the basic care for humanity and justice, which actually the the liberals don't really have a claim for if they don't believe in the uniqueness of yeah. human life. And how can they claim uh, concepts of justice if they don't have a grounding of being, an ontological yeah. basis for the idea of justice? Absolutely. It just becomes relativized to whatever they think is the most fashionable virtue signaling campaign to fight for. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know. uh, it's true. So, yes, we need to... So your final word to all our brothers and sisters who think that science and uh, religion are in conflict with one another, your final word to all those Christians who have bought into the skepticism about global warming. Mm -hmm. Your final word to your brothers and sisters who are 
um, reticent to engage with this topic because of everything that comes along with it. Okay. What message would you give to those people? Okay. Those three points. Right. Um, firstly, yes, you are still my brothers and sisters in Christ if you disagree with me about global warming and climate change or you think that science is, um, is part of the liberal media. But I would encourage you... Speak up for the camera. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, what were the three points again? So firstly, let's science and religion. Science and religion. Um, the Christian faith is not in conflict with science. Those that disbelieve in the idea of uh, global warming, those Christians who don't, or who are bought into skepticism. Okay. Um, so, read the facts. Um, it's very clear that it's happening. And um, people, are, people are suffering um, as a result of it. This is not an issue that we can just point the finger at or say it's nothing to do with us or say that it's, that it's irrespective of us. It's um, the, people, you know, the people who are claiming that it has nothing to do with us normally have some sort of financial incentive or they're linked to the oil industry. Or, um, so we need, you know, check, check your facts, basically, and it's an important thing. And where would you point them to to check those facts? Um, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a huge body of scientific textbooks and literature on this stuff. And I don't think we need to be, we need to be skeptical on that. Yeah. Um, and what about those Christians that fear to get in bed with this cause that you're involved with mm -hmm. because of all the other stuff that groups tag along to it? What, what do you say to, the, to that issue? So, obviously it depends slightly on the, um, slightly on the cause or the, the circles you're in, but as, as a Christian, um, it's our responsibility to stand what we have to, to, to make a stand for what we, we have a right to stand for. That is, you know, we, if, if climate change is real and is, and, is, and is a real issue and is happening and it's a justice issue, then we have a right to care about that. And, um, we, and you know, to, when, when you get involved in something like that, you, you can, and actually, in my experience with Extinction Rebellion, faith's been very much a welcome part of the conversation because there are lots of Christians who are part of it. And it, it isn't the case that you have to go along with all the other agendas. So you no. can oppose abortion mm. and support environmental concern. Yes. And that's yeah, what so. you do. And that's what I do. Have you done that in any of your conversations? Has um, that ever come up? My faith has definitely come up, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I've been able to share positively the hope that I have in Christ yeah. and um, yeah and, you know people disagree with that but I mean I love talking about okay. Jesus. So. Dr. Debi, thank yeah. you very much for that educational talk. Thank you. Guys the, the reason why I wanted to do this talk is very simple it's been very clear throughout. One science and the Christian faith are not in conflict. Two there's a real issue that as Christians we have to own and it doesn't mean going along with all the other things that people tag on to that and three that biblical fundamentalism is a historical development that is recent. It is not something that is connected to Christian history down through the ages. Living proof that you can be a scientist and a Christian. Great. Peace be with you. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. There we go. Risen indeed. Okay, let's go support Jenny.